New challenges and new directions, popular drama. Can I help you? I was looking for James Brandt. Aren't we all? Off to a fast start, trainer. Brandt's obviously in some kind of trouble. Well, then so's Arkenfield. If he's done a runner, Mike, where does that leave you? Is this the end of the House of Elliot? It's not just a trip to Paris. It's going to change our lives. You throw away everything you've built up. Jack, we might never be offered this chance again. Gilles Carignac is arguably the finest... It's more than that, isn't there it? Is. I've seen the way you look at him. New problems and newcomers in casualty. How much fluid has he had? Just what the ambulance crew gave him. He seemed in good shape. I didn't Seen? think... Seemed? Was... Well done, Doctor. You've been here less than a week. You've nearly succeeded in killing one of your first patients. It's dramatic. Autumn drama on one. Well, this evening's Top of the Pops includes Take That, Undercover, Betty Boo, Luther Vandross and Janet Jackson, and Annie Lennox. You're watching BBC One for the East Midlands. East Midlands Today, with Shuley Ghosh and Ian Bolton. Good evening. In tonight's programme, the human cost of the recession as unemployment rises again in the East Midlands. Is there any hope for the people of the worst-hit town in the region? A new scheme which will give police officers more time with their families. In sport tonight, cricket's NatWest final will be between two East Midland clubs. Northamptonshire beat Warwickshire and Leicestershire are through for the first time after a thrilling victory over Essex. That's it, that's it, that's it. And half paddle will travel. The Olympic medalist off in search of further glory. The number of people out of work in the East Midlands has risen yet again. Figures released today show that just over 132,000 people in the region are now unemployed. It's the latest evidence that the recession is continuing to create havoc. In a moment, I'll be speaking to the Employment Minister, Patrick McLaughlin. But first, our industry correspondent, John Brain, reports from the region's unemployment black spot, Mansfield. It tells you that. Uh, Three, six, eight, yeah, one. it tells you how to. Oh, there. Measure them there. Finding the bargains in the catalogues is more important than ever for the Fallows family these days. The sole breadwinner is out of work and money is tight. Steve Fallows lost his job as a security officer at a local electronics factory in May. He was previously unemployed ten years ago during the last recession. But this time his prospects look far bleaker. It's so depressing around this part of the country, there's not that many jobs about. Some of the jobs I've applied for, I'm too old. Some, I'm not old enough. And I've got no experience apart from the jobs that I've been doing. And it's just impossible now. It's so depressing. Mr Fellows is in good company. Nearly 8,000 people in the Mansfield travel to work area are unemployed. Over 11% of the working age population, making it the jobless black spot of the East Midlands. The tattered flag of what was once the town's biggest employer, an eloquent pointer of what's gone wrong. The only activity at Sherwood Pit these days is reclamation work. New industries such as this Japanese textile factory are coming, but the 400 new jobs here won't be enough to compensate for the thousands that have been lost from the town. So urgent measures are being taken. This new community point is one initiative. It functions as an independent job centre on the doorstep for the people of Forest Town saving them a usually wasted bus ride to the official one in the centre of Mansfield. Morning, Steve. Yeah. Fine. Have a seat. Right, thank uh, Any further news on the job I applied for? Yeah, one of the problems, really. Over the last 12 weeks, with the inception of the project, we've, we've, created, we've found about 23 full-time jobs, uh, but we're now finding that employers are actually ringing us, uh, and we're going to our skills audit well, database, and we, can, we reckon we can fill a job, a vacancy, within one day. It's now just a matter of uh, which colour for the actual suite. If you want to take a, take a seat. Bill Jack is one of those that have benefited from the scheme. Right. Okay, 79995 is actually in the sale at the moment. So um, if we For a would-be musician, um, part-time work at a carpet store um, isn't exactly his dream job. But after a year on the dole, at least it's something. It's been very difficult. Uh, I spent 13 months looking and... Uh, to be perfectly honest with you, it's a, a very, very difficult time for anybody to find work. Uh, 
Mansfield, it's a black spot, definitely. But some say various schemes aren't enough and claim Mansfield's special problems means the government should designate it an assisted area. Youngsters here, 100 youngsters are chasing every single job, 35 adults every single job, and it's about time that the government woke up and started to give us the status, give us the, the tools to go out and create jobs and bring, bring full unemployment to the area. In the meantime, the people of Mansfield will just have to wait and hope for an economic recovery that still shows no sign of arriving. And joining me now from our London studio is the Employment Minister, Patrick McLaughlin. Mr McLaughlin, um, unemployment is up for the 27th consecutive month. Isn't it time the government is doing something about this? Well, I think the government is doing something about it. Obviously, it's always regrettable when there's any increase in unemployment. But what we can't do is take short-term measures, which in the long, long term would be more damaging. But the rising unemployment is affecting consumer confidence, people aren't spending, companies aren't investing, and that's just dragging out the recession. Yes, I, I think one, mustn't, one must look at the figures and look at them as a whole. We never judge any particular set of figures on one month alone. And if one looks at these figures over the last three months, we would have seen that unemployment has risen over that three-month period less than at any time over the last two years. So I don't think it's quite as uh, gloomy or as depressing as you're saying. And yet that's no comfort to the 29,000 who've joined the dole queues. How can you reassure them? Of course it's no comfort to the 29,000 who've jo joined the dole queues. And therefore what we've got, as far as the government is concerned, is a number of various schemes which will help certainly the long-term unemployed as far as uh, training and job interviews, restart schemes, all available through the job service, through, through the job agencies, and also through the training and enterprise councils uh, situated through the country. What about particular black spots, though? In our own area, we have Mansfield, for example. What can the government offer to those areas? Well, I, I've just outlined the role in which the employment service plays. We've also got the local training and enterprise councils now set up, uh, covering every particular every part of the United Kingdom. They are locally based, so that they can actually address specific local problems in, in a, an area as far as retraining is concerned and are hopefully helping those people who are long-term unemployed. Mr McLaughlin, thank you for joining us. Engineers are still working this evening to move a derailed train which has caused rail travellers problems all day. The freight train went off the rails a mile north of Leicester Station at the height of the rush hour this morning. No one was hurt but roads nearby were closed because of the danger of wagons toppling, toppling off a bridge. The derailment left five aggregate wagons hanging precariously over an embankment and bridge. At one point, four lines of this mainline Midlands to London route were blocked as work started to clear the wreckage. The danger of the wagons falling was enough for the police to close the road, disrupting local businesses. We have been uh, to use different uh, routes, uh, but we just can't get through because this is the shortest way from one place to another uh, to us because we have another factory, but we have to take a different, different direction now. The accident just before 8 a.m. and only a mile north of Leicester Station also caused travel chaos, with commuters and trains delayed up to an hour. This afternoon, engineers started shifting the wagons. We're using a very large train, and that's going to be utilised to put them back uh, initially onto a piece of waste ground. We expect the operation is going to take about uh, four to five hours. Train services are expected to be back to normal tomorrow morning. An investigation started into the accident's cause. A man from Nottingham has drowned after the dinghy he was sailing in sank off the Scottish coast. He's been named as Peter Mawson Harris, a 59-year-old insurance broker. The Coast Guard said Mr Mawson Harris had been staying at a holiday park near Gatehouse of Fleet in southwest Scotland. He'd been in a seven-foot dinghy with a friend in the Solway Firth when it was sunk by a squall. The other man reached the shore, but Mr Mawson Harris drowned. An inquiry is underway into his death. The police have arrested two youths in connection with two separate air gun shootings in Nottingham this week. The teenagers have been questioned by detectives for most of today. 21-year-old Mandy Sharp was shot in the face at close range on Monday night. She was hit as she waited at a bus stop in Sherwood. The pellet pierced her cheek and lodged in her gum. Earlier, in a separate incident, a lorry driver was shot in the arm. An East Midlands police force has become the first in the country to introduce part-time officers. It's part of a year-long experiment by the Home Office, which it's hoped will make it easier for police officers who have children to continue with their careers. Rob Pittam reports. 
When Sue Stevens starts her shift at Newark Police Station, she's only halfway through her working day. Sue also has her eight-month-old baby Adam to look after. In the past, officers like her have found it impossible to combine the demands of bringing up a child with the rigours of police work. But now the Nottinghamshire Force has joined a pilot scheme which allows men and women to work part-time. I can spend more time at home with Adam and my husband and we can enjoy our life a bit more. But also I can carry on with the job because I do enjoy, you know, the police work. And um, I was just sort of like put it on a semi-hold really for the, whilst I do the part-time, whilst I bring up Adam and if I have another one and then I can go back to it full-time. Sixteen officers like Sue will be allowed to cut their hours and work part-time and the scheme also has its benefits for the police force too. If people are coming to work for two days a week they're going to put a lot of effort into it. They're not going to be tired, they're going to be full of eagerness and energy and enthusiasm to do the job to the, the very best of their ability during a very short time scale. Meanwhile Sue is convinced the idea will catch on. I'm hoping that um, people will take it and see it for what it is. Um, I'm glad that Nottinghamshire is one of the six that's actually been able to um, do the trial. Uh, I think I'd have been upset if it wasn't, and how, like in the other forces, having to look, because there must be many that want to do it, um, watching us now for a year to see whether it works out. But I think, and I hope, it will be adopted nationally, just for the sake of everybody else that wants to do it. Nottinghamshire's experiment with part-time policing will last for a year. Sue believes that after that, more officers will be able to follow in her footsteps. People who dropped litter in the streets of Derby will now have to face the wrath of a new litter warden. Derby City Council's employed the officer as part of the Brighter Derby campaign, designed to keep the city cleaner and educate local school children about the problems litter causes. He doesn't have the power to make people pick up litter, but he can report offenders to the police and act as a witness in court. The fine for dropping litter can now be as high as £1,000. So you've been warned. On to sport and celebrations today for two East Midlands cricket sides. Here's Ian. The final of the NatWest Trophy will be an all East Midland affair between Leicestershire and Northamptonshire. Leicestershire beat Essex by five wickets to go through to the final for the first time, while Northamptonshire completed a three-wicket victory over Warwickshire. North Hand started the day at Edgbaston with a fairly straightforward task. They needed a further 103 runs to win. But then they started to lose wickets alarmingly. Lamb, a victim for Gladstone Small, caught by Keith Piper. Then Nigel Felton, who'd made 58, skied one to Warwickshire's captain Andy Lloyd. And North Hans began to look wobbly. The jitters continued as Curran was caught again by Lloyd. And Alan Donald took the wicket of Tony Penbethy, LBW for just two. North Hants needed just 10 runs to win as David Capel was caught and bowled Reed. by Reeve. But these hiccups were soon irrelevant as Jeremy Snape hit the winning That's runs, it. which will take North Hants to Lords for the final. Uh, Leicestershire's Winston Benjamin claimed two wickets this morning to finish with three for 40 and restrict Essex to 226 for eight off their 60 overs. Nigel Bryars, the Leicestershire captain, then helped give them a solid start, grafting his way to a half century. He also shared a second wicket oh, partnership worth 86 with James Whittaker. Well, that was a wonderful shot from James Whittaker. But having made 46, Whittaker was caught. Oh, and that's a miss, Ed, going to pull it. Wasn't quite sure that... Uh... After losing Benjamin for one and Phil Robinson for 15, Leicestershire needed 27 off the last five overs. But they lost that's Briars, who got a top edge and was caught on the boundary after making 88. In a thrilling final over, Leicestershire needed three to win, but Laurie Potter failed to score off four balls. Stevenson then bowled a wide. And Justin Benson struck the following ball to the boundary to give Leicestershire victory with one ball to spare. It sparked the Leicestershire celebrations, and among them is Quentin Rayner. Well, as you'd expect, the celebrations are well underway here at Grace Road as Leicestershire relish their first ever NatWest final. And joining me now are two of the heroes of the hour, captain and man of the match, Nigel Briars, and valiant veteran, Jonathan Agnew. Nigel, it was a close run thing, wasn't it? Yeah, it was always going to be close against a, a side like Essex. Um, they're a fine side. and We were pleased with uh, holding them to 226 for their innings, but uh, we knew even then that we, it was going to be a difficult task because they've got uh, a lot of good bowlers who bowl a tight line, a slowish wicket, uh, but at the end of the day we managed to scrape home. Now what does it mean to you personally having led Leicestershire to this final? Yeah, it means a hell of a lot really, you know, Leicester lad and uh, 
been with the club a number of years now. Uh, it's history today because the, the club's never been to the final ever. You know, Jonathan and I both played in the uh, Benson Edges uh, final, which we won in 1985, which, funny enough, was against Essex then. And uh, but um, you know, I've uh, played in one other semi-final, but never we've never been to the final in that way. So it's uh, we're looking forward to it. Now, what about this fellow to your left? Eh? He, he, did, he didn't do badly, did he, for, for, for an Oldham? No, he did terrific. I managed to uh, talk him into it, I think, on Tuesday morning at Nets. Uh, he did bowl well and uh, he's done a couple of runs and tried to uh, prepare himself because he knew he was, uh, might be needed, which is more training he's done uh, while he was a professional at Leicester. So uh, that, was, uh, that, was a good, uh, that was a good sign. But, uh, but will you be selecting him for the final? <clears throat> well, we'll have to see how many injuries we've got then. You know, I mean, he did a, he did a, great, jo he did a great job. Um, I knew it, he knew it was going to be a difficult for him. Uh, he didn't want to let himself down, he didn't want to let the side down. But um, at the end of the day, I think uh, that if he didn't play for us, and he'd, he'd probably feel that he'd let, uh, he'd let us down more than himself. And, you know, all credit to Jonathan, it was a terrific effort to... Uh, I think you were knackered after six <laughs> overs, but uh, we thought it was best to try and get through 12 if we could. Jonathan, do you want to be playing in the final? <laughs> I'd love to. It'll be under the same circumstances if I was to, in that I wouldn't want to be selected above the professionals who are here. There were some moments in the last couple of days that I'll never forget. It was wonderful to come back. It was wonderful to be part of the team again. I'm glad personally that I got away with it. I'm still not quite sure how. Um, it's just great to be here and, and to have enjoyed the day. It's all been a bit of a fairy tale, hasn't it, really? It has. I mean, the only other thing I could have done would have taken six for ten, I suppose, but um, you know, one for 31 is fine. Congratulations to you both. It's been a great day's cricket and much enjoyment to us all. And now we can look forward to an all East Midlands final at Lords next month. Saturday, September the 5th, the date for your diary. Well, in football, Derby County have named Michael Forsyth as their club captain for the new season, which starts this weekend. The 26-year-old left-back, who's Derby's longest-serving player, has captained the side during the pre-season friendlies. Well, with the Olympic Games over, Britain's medal winners could be forgiven for resting on their laurels. But there's been no let-up for Gareth Marriott, who won a silver medal in the canoeing. He was at home near Nottingham for just two days before heading off for the next competition in the United States. Tom Hill caught up with him between flights. For a couple of days, Gareth Marriott's distinctive zebra-striped canoe was back in its store at the National Water Sports Centre at home Pierpont. Two weeks ago, it was used to make history, Britain's first ever canoeing Olympic medal. And although he was proud to take silver in Spain, Gareth only missed the gold medal by a whisker when he clipped a gate on the course. Now he's ready for another series of competitions in the United States. It's been normal for the last couple of years. We've spent the winters um, away in warmer climes and uh, the summers dashing from one place to the next doing competitions or training. So this is sort of rather normal. Are you looking forward to a period in the future when you'll be able to sort of sit back and, uh, and contemplate what actually happened in Barcelona this summer? Well, when I get back from America, I should be taking my annual rest period, which you sort of need to, so you can go higher next year, take about four or five weeks off out of the boat before starting the next year's training. So during that period, it's usually a big period of contemplation and planning for the next year and beyond that as well. Three quarters of the Great Britain Olympic canoeing squad live in Nottingham so they can practice and compete at home Pierpont. Gareth, who moved from Mansfield to be near the centre, has no doubt that using the artificial slalom course there helped the team in Spain. It was something that I knew years ago was going to be essential for improvement. Unless we came to a facility like this, you just weren't going to catch up with the other Europeans and Americans that were light years ahead of us. Um, Richard Fox had done very well in the past on using natural water, but you know even he realised that this place was going to be essential, so he moved, moved over here from uh, Stafford. Gareth had scores of cards congratulating him on his Olympic success, but his hectic globe-trotting schedule hasn't left him with much time to read them all. Well, on to our weekly entertainments guide. And those of you who joined us last Thursday will remember we ran a competition. The top prize, a choice of 10 best-selling videos from your local boot store. Well, we had hundreds of entries, and in just a moment, I'll be picking out the winner. But right now, here's one more chance to see if you can make out the word that appears on the fan in the opening titles of Now Showing.
Sam didn't kill that woman. The first time he met her was at the airport, just like he told you. Have you ever met Sam? No. Then you're not a policeman, and neither is Sergeant Croker. Is it in the safe? Who was she? I can't tell you that. Did you kill her? No. Did Mr. Roach? You don't have to know that either. Now, is it in the safe? Susie's blind. One day, while her husband is away uh, working on an assignment, Susie returns to her flat, unknowing that three men are now occupying it. One of them, Mike, claims to be an old friend of her husband's and wins his way into her confidence. So it is quite a little shock to her when she discovers that he's not all that he claims to be. Now, that was stupid, wasn't it? Really stupid. Susie, the key. Please, you said I could have it. I've hidden it. Very carefully. It's somewhere in this flat, but that's the only clue I'll give you. I'm not going to start searching for it. You're going to give it to me now. Then you'll have to make me give it to you. Well, I don't think I couldn't. I wonder. You won't have to wonder very long. Then you'll have to hurt me very much, and I'm not so sure you can do that. You don't know me very well. I think I do. You don't know me at all, do you? You can know some people very well in a short time, and I think it's quicker if you're blind. <laughs> I'm sitting here in Abbey Park, Leicester, where on Saturday the 15th of August, from 12 noon onwards, you can see the 11th annual Abbey Park Music Festival. It's a free concert featuring the best music that Midlands has got to offer. It's got dance, rock, and these people here, Poe. Just between you two channels no one sees Why does your brother never speak to anyone The Week of Vessel exhibition takes a critical look at the undervalued role played by women in not only the Civil War, but also the wider social framework of the 17th century. The Civil War exhibition looks at this most turbulent period of English history and shows some stunning arms and armour that's never before been on public display outside of the Tower of London. You. you can even try some armour on. Everybody should know by now what the word is on the fan, but just to prove we're not cheating, here's another look at it. And the word is, of course, theatre. Well, hundreds spotted it. Many thanks to all the entrants who wrote in. I've got all the uh, postcards and letters that you sent here, and I'm going to pick one out. And the first one I pick out, we'll be in touch with, and they'll be able to go along to their boot store and pick out 10 best selling videos of their choice. Put that back down there. And the winner is. Jay Scorey of 11 Brocklehurst Road, Melton Mowbray. I don't know if you're a miss, Mrs or Mr, but Jay Scorey. Uh, you'll be able to pick out 10 best-selling videos, but just to prove that we're not very stingy, we're going to give two runners-up um, prizes, and they are uh, Mr B Birch of Blandford Gardens Meadowfields in West Bridgeford, and if I can read this one, Joseph Maslin of 79 Ella Road, also of West Bridgeford. It wasn't a fix, I promise, in Nottingham. And they'll be able to get a handful of now showing goodies. So that's all three of you. We will be in touch. Well done. We'll move on to the weather now. Here's Joe Wheeler.
Well, there are at least three people who've had an otherwise dull day brightened up for them. No such luck for the rest of us after a fairly dull and a damp day. We've got a wet evening in store, rain through most of the region. To be more specific, up in the north of the region, Derbyshire and North Nottinghamshire, you'll find the rain fairly light. But as you come further south, down towards Northamptonshire, that rain may just be a little bit on the heavy side. And that rain's going to stay with us through most of the evening. Later on, though, we've got drier, clearer conditions coming in from the north. Overnight temperatures will fall away to 9 degrees Celsius, 48 degrees Fahrenheit and the winds will fall light as well just to a light northwesterly. However of course we've got a lot of moisture around in the air so we might just have some mist around dawn. Well, by the time we wake up tomorrow morning we may well find some broken cloud outside the window. What's actually happening is a particularly nasty area of low pressure is exiting through the eastern door whilst we've got high pressure moving in from the west. What this means to us is that most people will have a dry bright and fairly sunny morning. However out in the east of the region especially Lincolnshire they may well get caught in the aftermath of that low pressure. So we might just get uh, one or two rogue showers developing during the morning. Temperature by midday up to 15 degrees Celsius, 59 degrees Fahrenheit. And again, we've got a fairly light northwesterly wind, although again, out in the east of the region, that wind may just be a little bit stronger than that. Out to tomorrow afternoon, and all those showers should disappear, and that'll give us all quite a nice afternoon. It'll be dry, bright, and fairly sunny. It won't be clear, clear, clear blue skies and strong sunshine, but a fair bit of sunshine. Temperatures up to 20 degrees Celsius, 68 degrees degrees Fahrenheit, again in a fairly light northwesterly wind. However, for those places that get a little more in the way of sunshine, you can expect those temperatures to rise at perhaps a degree or two. Saturday's looking good to start, some rain later on. I'll give you more details about that at the same time tomorrow night. That's it from me. And finally, a look at tonight's closing headlines. Unemployment has risen for the 27th month running. More than 2,750,000 an hour out of work. And the regional jobless total is also up. And it'll be an all East Midlands final in cricket's NatWest Trophy. North Ants beat Warwickshire and Leicestershire beat Essex with just one ball to spare. That's it from us. I'm back with the late news at 28 minutes past nine. And uh, we're both back tomorrow, aren't we? We are, actually. 30 in the studio with Joe Wheeler with the weather. We'll see you then. Bye-bye. In 1808 in Vienna, a new Beethoven symphony was heard for the first time and shocked its audience. Now it's maybe the best known piece of symphonic music in the world. And you can hear Beethoven's Fifth Symphony and Mahler's Rückert Lieder with the Cleveland Orchestra from the Royal Albert Hall on BBC Proms on One tomorrow at 10.20. Workaholic Ian Beale fails to show up for work in half an hour and causes speculation amongst the East Enders. First on one, we catch up with who has arrived at Top of the Pops. musical mission with a helping hand from two unlimited, the gorgeous Betty Boo in exclusive Annie Lennox and scoring large screens on the Richter scale. Welcome, take that! Yeah! 